much for having us here. Um, I'm Junho Bei. I'm from a startup incubator and an investor platform called Tenity. Uh, we invest in fintechs and insure techs globally, especially in Europe and Asia Pacific. I look after the Asia Pacific in, uh, investment practices here. Very honored to be here with esteemed colleagues here. Um, yeah, maybe we can go around the room with a short introduction about yourself. Christina? Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Christina. I'm the co-founder and COO here at Lydia AI. We work with insurance companies to figure out how to layer together all sources of alternative data in order to make risk projections that can be you go towards personalizing experience, uh, transforming underwriting, and all that cool stuff. Hi, uh, I'm Sue. Um, I'm from MetLife Asia. Um, so I'm leading uh, digital distribution excellence, uh, we call it, uh, which is to uh, improve uh, our sales distribution capabilities uh, through digital transformation and also uh, managing our agent uh, digital experience. Uh, because our uh, major channel um, is agency channel, so we manage uh, their digital experience you know, to improve our sales and also to provide a better customer service. Hi, I'm Eddie Wong. I'm the uh, co-founder CEO of a Malaysian-based uh, insure tech company. Uh, we are one of the sandbox players under the uh, Bandagara Central Bank of Malaysia, where essentially it allows us to test a digital general insurance model under the sandbox framework. Uh, we um, disrupt or positively disrupt in the area of distribution, uh, on-demand insurance, uh, P2P, and also in the micro insurance space. So we've been operating in the sandbox for the past uh, 18 months now, it's doing quite good. And we also uh, collaborate with uh, global insurers uh, in Malaysia. And also we have lately doubled into the UK market. Uh, I'll tell more about that during the conversation. Yeah, thanks Eddie. Um, I'm uh, indeed Alan Marriott. I uh, chair the technology segment of Aeon's strategy and technology group. Uh, this topic is very dear to my heart. Um, I started and founded a fintech back in uh, 2012 called Taiki, and uh, following the usual very well-trodden path, um, managed to join Aeon in uh, March 2022, where we help our very wide client base uh, gain access to and use and to gain insight from the massive expansion in data that we all see in, 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 uh, in our industry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introductions. I think we'll get a lot of um, variety of experiences from this panel. Uh, we'll kick you off with first question. So going to the basics. So why do some traditional insurers uh, prefer to innovate with startups and some do it themselves? So maybe I'll get some uh, insights from Alan yourself on what different positions that traditional insurers have. Yeah, thanks, Jun Ho. I mean, obviously, this is a very wide topic, and I could be here for an hour talking on this alone. I've been promised to only do two very quick or three very quick points. I think the first point really is about risk. Uh, if you look at uh, the risks of startups generally, uh, there's the old adage, we've all heard it, one in 10 survive, and obviously nine in 10 don't. And I think the, the point is, is that um, you need to take that risk early, and sometimes the appetite for that sort of innovation and risk is something which a, a larger corporate can't, can't face. Um, sometimes it's the other way around. But uh, I think for me, it's uh, perhaps the main driver for how you, uh, how you get investment. And it's not just money, it's the people, it's the human capital. Sometimes those staff members you need to innovate uh, are less attracted to the standard paycheck and would like to be involved in the company at a more equity level. So I think it's all about the people and the team that you um, work with and attracting that team is absolutely essential to getting the startup off off the ground so it's, there's no easy win I think there's always a chance but for a, for you know a, a very large company the ability to invest in a fintech sort of bypasses that first risk point and you can jump in when the tech has been proven uh, that's probably the key for me thank you I think, you know, that, that question, um, I will have a different version of that. And, uh, when we first started off about four years ago, it was a, it's, a, it's a different perspective, but now it's very different. It depends on, I would say it depends on market maturity, depending on how the insurers uh, perceive insure techs like us, uh, how we can collaborate. 
five, ten years ago, it might be someone that they don't know. You know, it's like now they're seeing us as potentially as one of the new channels they want to work with because um, InsurTech like us nowadays, uh, we, we find ways to disrupt in a very positive manner. We try to understand the, the insurers, uh, you know, they're, they're, what they need and how we can actually present a business case to them and leverage on technology to disrupt and go into certain markets that they've ne never thought of before. So I, I would say that the last three years, uh, the willingness from insurer to partner with InsurTech like us is very, very big now. You know, um, and, and the trust level, you know, Ellen, we spoke about the trust level. The trust level that we have cultivated with the insurers is getting stronger and stronger. Um, there's a lot more room for innovation and positively disrupting the market. Um, yeah. Well, uh, to me, um, I think startups uh, and insure techs um, already become part of uh, the insurance um, ecosystem. So all insurance companies, uh, they work with the startups and insure tech in one way or the other, right? And it's just, um, I think, different, uh, the way they engage with them and the way they work with them and maybe the value that they want to get uh, from that uh, partnership, uh, it's, a, it's a bit different. So uh, we recently had an um, open innovation program in Korea. Uh, Korea is our second largest uh, market uh, in MetLife Asia. Um, so definitely the major reason and the major purpose of uh, having that open innovation is to uh, search and to find um, good you know, uh, startups you know, who can help us to address uh, some uh, business opportunities and the challenges and pain points. Um, but the start um, that we uh, had this one, this uh, journey actually uh, was sometime similar this time last year um, when uh, we were uh, developing the business plan for this year, 2023, and also investment plan. And when Korea CEO, um, he insisted to <laughs> include and allocate certain budget and also time uh, for this innovation program for this year, actually, um, I was wondering uh, why would they need that? Because our Korea teams, uh, to them, innovation is not uh, something new. It's actually part of their day-to-day -day business. And the open innovation probably is not maybe uh, something you know, interesting to them. That's what I thought. Um, but what Korea CEO explained to them uh, that time, yeah, absolutely, we, uh, we should continue to look for any uh, additional solution providers, any startups, which we haven't uh, come across yet. That's the main reason. But second reason that he uh, pointed out, which was very interesting to me, was the learning and the uh, development opportunity for his teams, the growth opportunity for his organization. So that was uh, the second reason that he really wanted to allocate time and the budget for open innovation. So. Um, when we had this uh, open innovation program called the Collab uh, a few months ago, uh, and actually Lydia AI was the final uh, three startups that we selected, uh, the, the most critical step that we had during that journey, that Collab uh, program was not the demo day, not the selection of the startups, it was more about the three weeks of uh, collaboration uh, program, collaboration time between MetLife Korea teams and the, uh, the startups. Because that's the, um, what really um, brought the value to the company because we really did a uh, deep dive uh, all the business challenges and the opportunities they came up with very meaningful, actionable business plans out of it. Yeah. So because of that you know, process, once we selected the three startups, including Lydia, 
so the next step, preparing the pilot, was very smooth because we already had the cross functional teams were there working with the startups. So preparing pilot, and I believe the deployment stage also will be very you know, smooth. And the, uh, as our career CEO wanted, there was learning and then growth in the organization. So maybe right. that's the, one of the reasons uh, why we need uh, this kind of partnership. Yeah, maybe Christina. Yeah, can... just adding on to this, I think one word cap or two words captures this. For insurers, you guys call it digital transformations. At startups, we are digital natives. So now if you really look at this, you want to build the future of insurance, it's going to go look like this really cool future buildings. You can either figure out how to mix the cement, do all of this, lay your own bricks, or you can actually look at a bunch of Lego blocks and go pop, 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 and put it together. And if it doesn't quite look like what you want, then you can actually take it apart and try again. So it really becomes, do you become a very good Lego builder or do you become a really good cement mixer? So the words capture it, it's digital transformation versus digital natives. How do you then capture the benefits of people who are digital natives in order to power this digital transformation in an industry that is, has managed trillions of dollars over time, but is going through that process of actually transforming? Yeah, I think the common theme that we're hearing is that we're constantly changing and constantly there's a need to innovate. And one of them is to redefine yourselves, but also you need to work with the newcomers to get that new uh, startup feel um, to your DNAs. Uh, I guess so next question is based on your experiences. How do the startup insurance partnership differ in Asia? Given that we have such an international crowd, uh, how does it differ in Asia versus in any other markets? Maybe I'll start with Eddie. Yeah, this, this is back to my earlier introduction. Um, we started off in Malaysia. Obviously, in Malaysia, we, as an insure tech, we, uh, we're partnering with uh, incumbent risk carrier. So it's proven to be successful despite you know, many rounds of trial and error, trial and error, we still are able to cultivate the trust you know, with the risk carrier. So um, late of 2021, we start you know, looking into some potential of dabbling into the UK market. Right? So we, uh, we sure we signed a joint venture with a local joint venture partner in UK. The UK market is different, right? The, the whole Insure tech thing over there is, uh, is we, we, we work on the MGA model in UK, right? Where we work with the broker and then brokers connect us with the reinsurer. And from the reinsurer, we work backwards and then back to the capacity provider. So it's very different compared to Asia where there's a very established risk carrier. You go to them with the right proposition, understanding the demands and supply. Then you go to them about the business case, how you can collaborate. Right. Whereas in UK, uh, what we learn is that you know, uh, we can actually curate something that's very interesting and that is very market relevant. We can go through the reinsurer, back through the broker and back to the capacity provider. So uh, that, that's the slight different uh, perspective that I can share uh, comparing Asia and UK. Yep. Christina? Well, the first thing that comes to mind for me is actually the heterogeneity of markets in Asia. That means when you think about partnerships in Asia, it's not really partnerships in Asia. It's probably partnerships country by country by country by country. And every country really looks like hand-to-hand -hand combat, where you're trying to understand what that population looks like, how that translates in different, different use cases, what the local businesses care about and whatnot. Versus when you're thinking about North America, U.S., yes, there's state-by-state state difference, but from a population perspective, just that there's a lot more homogeneity than there are in Asian markets. So that, I would say, is the difference. There's much more uh, barrier of learning that you have to get through and plow through that's a market by market by market that is not to be underestimated by startups. Ellen? Yeah, indeed. <clears throat> Sorry, I was going to echo that. Uh, that uh... That point also. I think it comes down to trust. And yeah. if you can build trust with your client, um, and that trust is a different sort of trust in each jurisdiction, whether it's state-based in America or whether it's country-based in Europe 
or whether across Asia, where there's so many countries, is building trust locally is very important. You need to create a, a, a hub to engineer and do the development because that can work more easy when people are in close proximity. But the actual delivery to the client is also best achieved through having a very local presence. So I think a globalized workforce with a globalized mindset that shares developments across all the units, but then a very local presence is absolutely essential. So effectively, I think it's the same problem that we face in all markets. It's very important to just work out how do you engage with your clients in the best way for, for them, both supporting and developing, uh, but work in a more collaborative international context. So do you see any difference within Asia Pacific well, um, I do understand you know, the challenges <laughs> for startups you know, having business in Asia um, because Asia consists of all different countries, right? We are all different. The language, uh, culture, currency, uh, economy, and uh, customer behavior, all different. So. Um, let alone the partnership between insurance and you know, uh, startups, right? Actually, for uh, a global insurer like uh, MetLife, uh, it is difficult to you know, run the business uh, in multiple countries, managing all the differences. So for startups, um, I guess it's uh, very difficult for them to tackle you know, all those you know, differences in Asia. Um, probably the best approach is to uh, for them to focus on uh, one country, uh, one market, one by one. Yeah. So they you know, learn um, yeah, one market and they bring that experience and the knowledge and uh, yeah, jump into you know, the next. That's the best approach, I think. And also um, sometimes um, I think it's helpful to have local partner in that you know, market because in certain markets in Asia, it takes a uh, long time and it takes lots of efforts to get used to and get familiarized with that market. And if you have any expertise helping you and supporting you um, for that market, uh, on site especially, I think um, this is going to be helpful. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just want to add on to the sure. point that Sue mentioned and trust. I think trust is. is absolutely critical like you know the having a partner on the ground like you know the uk ventures that product design is asia technology is asia but we have no clue how the market will behave in uk so the local partners actually complement almost 80 percent of the whole thing right technology product design is a given it's the supply side of thing but understanding the demand of the local market is very important that's why having the trust and the partner on the ground is absolutely critical like like now as we speak and i'm talking to someone from the the Manai side middle east side i have no clue about the whole market landscape in, in Manai, but i just have to trust that they have the market knowledge let's connect on the technology and 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 the product design side so yeah you guys are absolutely spot on and I think this is a great place to meet those partners, um, to scale your products to different countries. And I think this last question is quite interesting. So from all your diverse backgrounds and your prior experiences, what are some tips on creating product, uh, productive startup insurer kind of partnerships? Especially we want to see more startups kind of working with traditional insurers and going to more deployment stages. So any tips, any suggestions, how to go about it? Uh, I'll start off with Christina. Yeah, I would start with like on day zero, we need to figure out how, what this looks like post implementation. How do you actually deal with the change management end of things? Like I like to say technology is actually super easy. We can train up lots of machine learning models. But at the end of the day, how do these models actually integrate into processes? Who are the people that are going to use it? Is IT prepared to actually port you in into their stack? What, what does that actually look like? Start knocking on the right doors from day zero when you're, when you're even in very, maybe a very limited statement of work, very limited pilot environment. That makes sure is that when 
people are ready for the tech itself because tech is tech is tech. So if you want to transform, there's a very big human element of it that, you know, a lot of startups, we're, we're, we're a different type of organization. We don't quite understand that. And the second thing to really align that is like something Sue and I have been talking about, which is KPI. Yo, what does success look like? And what does success look like this year? What does it look like post-deployment? What does that look like afterwards? How much do we success do we need to show in a limited capacity that makes insurers actually willing to take that leap of faith to do more with you? And if we're not clear on that, and whatever KPIs that are set up isn't driving like the PL forward at the end of the day, then you know what are we doing here? It's just gonna be like another cute project that has a lot of documents associated with that's gonna be living in the abyss. Yeah, maybe I'll jump to Alan, uh, given that you've gone through the whole spectrum of even getting acquired by a, a global company like Aon. So what kind of tips do you have to follow up on that? So, so, so we have the hour, yeah, and roughly, no. Um, I think I've got a few, few, few points that are quite, un, I think, related, but the first one is obviously technology. I mean, we are a technology operation. Um, and the question you ask is, and this is an, maybe two years ago, the old adage, <clears throat> you know, you need um, a problem seeking a solution, not a solution seeking a problem. That would have been true even two, three years ago. But we've seen the sheer speed of innovation recently with, you know, generative AI and other technologies, where actually you've got technology moving ahead of where the problem space is. And we're looking for now finding the ways of applying that great technology in problems we haven't yet explored. So it's, it's going a bit, you know, head over ta uh, tails. So that's the first thing, is that we've got to make sure we apply the technology to the business area properly and, and fast and respond quickly. Um, the second one is strategy, and we've all uh, been involved in technology startups at some phase. Um, it's important to create or understand what you're trying to achieve at the beginning, to your point. You know, you're building technology, which is a Lego block within a bigger ecosystem. Very important to understand why you're doing it. How do you fit into the ecosystem goal in, in the end, end state? So having a plan at the beginning for what your company is trying to achieve is really, really important. The next one is culture. And I mean, I've been very lucky to join a firm like Aon that has a very creative, innovative culture. Um, and that's not always the case. So it's important to find a fit for how you're going to evolve, whether that's organic, where you grow, grow and keep growing independently for those years and go through the Series A, Series B and carry on growing or um, fire um, funding or whether you are you know, buying, you know, whether, you, whether you acquire firms or whether you are acquired yourself. So it's cultural aspects are very important. And the last point, I will talk to too long. The last point is about the people again. I mentioned this point uh, earlier today and we were discussing it yesterday as well in some of the plenary sessions. Talent is absolutely key and there's a war for talent out there. You've got to surround yourself with the brightest people you can, support them, retain them, train them, invest in them, so that your business keeps innovating. I think that's the most important factor out of all of them is have the right people around you. And that's, yeah, that's the, the top five or top four, sorry. Thank you. Amazing. So maybe I'll ask you from coming from the insurer perspective, like, are there any tips to, because I, I've been on both sides as well. Uh, so, and there are special tips and ways to go about speaking to corporate partners. So any tips from your side? Well, you know, um, the easy and the very obvious answer is you succeed in pilot, right? <laughs> then, then you can uh, go to deployment stage. Um, yeah, that's the easy and the very obvious answer. And then, uh, as we talked uh, uh, yesterday, Christina, definitely you need, um, you need to define uh, the success very clearly, and you have to communicate, and you have to, you have to get alignment with all the stakeholders, because uh, the definition of success could be different. So once you, you know, get success you know, from the pilot, and then when you evaluate the result with that all the uh, aligned you know, success criteria, then of course you can go to the next step deployment uh, stage. Um, but I'd like to add uh, one more thing uh, on top of that. Um, so I would suggest um, 
maybe you you have to figure out uh, to prove and to show sustainable business relationship with insurance companies because um, insurance business is uh, all about sustainability and continuity right because uh, we have to keep our long-term promise uh, to customers so we have to you know, keep sustainability and the continuity and it also applies to any business uh, relationship and any partnership that we have so if you uh, so it's not like okay this service and this solution uh, look very cool okay open it today and then next month oh, sorry we shut it down. We cannot do that. We have to be very prudent, right? So I think that is maybe uh, something uh, for startups you know, to uh, show during the pilot, giving that, as you know, Ellen mentioned, trust, and then that sustainable business relationship, the potential. Maybe that, um, yeah, kind of uh, tips that I can give. Right. Um, I mean, I used to be on the corporate venture side of an uh, airline as well. So the tips I used to give are find your champions internally who can actually vouch on behalf of you. And then also uh, find the lowest hanging fruits uh, for you to actually give to middle management because you need to keep them interested. Um, Eddie, you came from both sides. So any tips? Um, okay, any probably I'll give perspective from a startup because I used to be from the, the insurer side, you know, so since I've been in the startup for the last four years, uh, trust, trust very important, trust and sustainability, you know, I, but it's really about how do you position yourself, a simple economics about understanding the demand and supply. Supply side, technology, I think we can do wonders, but really understanding the demand from the market where things have changed so drastically for the last couple of years is really, really important. How can we position, even if, if we are a digital insurer, you need to understand what area of market they are, they are going into, really understanding the demand side, or even if you collaborate with a, with a global insurer. So understanding the simple economics of demand and supply is important and really have a really understanding about the supply chain. Are you disrupting in the product development side or underwriting claims or the back end, you know, in all this stuff, which area you're good at and how do you add value to the global insurer. And trust is important. And I agree having the right people in place is important, giving us space to innovate. And the last point probably is being a startup, uh, it's different from the corporate side. You need to have the perseverance and tenacity to pivot. Sometimes, you know, it's like first two years we're doing on demand and all this stuff, but it doesn't work. Seriously, it doesn't work, right? And then we have to look into different channels. How do we do it on the B2B side and all stuff like that. So you have to have the ability to pivot as and when you need it. And how do we continue to cultivate the trust with a risk carrier so that they can consistently trust you to work with you? That's important. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think my... My recommendation for startups is usually to have patience, but also I also recommend the corporate partners to also be a bit more challenging uh, in terms of trying new innovations um, and having that kind of innovation mindset and change management because that was the difficulty that I had convincing my business units. Any last thoughts, Christina? We are realistically impatient. <laughs> yes. Yeah, startups run on tight timelines, so we understand that. But I think we're, we will be seeing more fruitful collaborations like you and uh, MetLife. Um, and hopefully we'll see more uh, innovation being driven by startups and insured partnerships, um, not only here in Asia Pacific, but globally. Thank you so much for being on this panel. Thank you for great insights. Please round of applause to the okay. panelists here.